Barely a month ago, the fast progress in the Japanese campaigns across the Pacific had prompted them to start what was one of their most important operations of the war, the invasion of the Dutch East Indies. As we've seen, the main objective of this operation was the island of Java, yet the invaders first needed to take several airports and major towns around it, known to the Japanese as Java's Dehor. Now the Japanese are on the verge of completing their conquest of these Dehor on Borneo, the Celebes and the Moluccas. Concurrently, the island of Java was also one of the main links of the Malay barrier, and its safety was a huge concern for the Abdicom. Seeing that it was to be in huge peril if the cities of Makassar and Banjimasin fell to the Japanese, the Allies prepared to fight in any manner they could to keep the melee barrier intact and accomplish their mission to protect the Dutch colony. The stage was set for a very important battle of the Pacific War. If you want to expand your territory without the fuss of a war in the Pacific, try the sponsor of this video established titles. It's a project that lets you become a lord or lady by purchasing a little plot of land in Scotland, where all landowners historically can claim these titles. But it's also a project to reforest the world, planting a tree with every order, preserving picturesque woodland and biodiversity, and supporting global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. You'll get at least one square foot of land in Scotland, with a certificate to not only show you exactly where it is, but to prove your new titles. This allows you to get Lord or Lady on your credit cards, plane tickets and more. It only takes 5 minutes to set up, so it's a great last minute gift for any loved one and you can get a couple pack that lets you and your partner have adjoining plots of land. They also offer maps to show your new estate, including the immensely detailed hand-drawn 1611 map by John Speed held by the National Library of Scotland. This is absolutely the best gift for Valentine's Day. It's fun and personalised. Make your loved ones a Lord or Lady of Scotland with established titles. They're even running a Valentine's Day sale with a special offer for our viewers. Use the code KNG to get an additional 10% off any purchase. Go to establishedtitles.com slash KNG to get your gifts now. Following the events of the last couple of weeks, General Sakaguchi and his detachment had achieved their second milestone in the Dutch East Indies operation, the conquest of Balik Papan. While the Kume detachment was mopping up the area, he was now preparing to launch the invasion of Banjamasin in conjunction with a naval strike force. But back on January 28th, it was finally decided that he would receive no support from the IJN and that his main forces would be appointed to support the invasion of Java. He then formed a strong unit under Colonel Yamamoto Kyohei, built around the main strength of the 146th Regiment. The plan for this unit was to rapidly advance towards the city of Banjimasin after going ashore at Tanagrogat, while a small element of the unit, under Captain Okamoto Yoshibumi, maneuvered along the coast in small boats to land in the southern area of the city and capture the Matapura airfield. On the night of January 30th, the Okamoto unit sailed from Balik Papan and started its advance southwards. The following morning, the Yamamoto unit also departed Balik Papan and reached Adang Bay by the night of the same day. After landing, the Yamamoto unit quickly seized the town of Tanagrogot on February 1st, but the 60 Dutch soldiers of the local garrison had burnt the town before retreating. This began the widespread native support for the invaders, and culminated with many desertions on the side of the Dutch. By February 3rd, all of the Japanese forces under Yamamoto had concentrated on Tanagrogot, finally starting their overland trek towards Banjimasin. At this point, Japanese forces were also very close to capturing the important town of Samarinda. From Lower Jinan, Captain Montero had been tasked with delaying as much as he could the Japanese advance towards the important Samarinda 2 airfield. But his mission was a very difficult one, especially since he wasn't allowed to launch any counterattack. Furthermore, the Kume detachment had already captured the oil fields at Sanga Sanga, and the Japanese were now ready to continue their advance against the town of Samarinda. Only Montero's men stood in their way. On February 2nd, though, 
Dutch forces discovered that another Japanese column was advancing from Balikpapan towards Mentawir, forcing Montero to move again his headquarters, this time to the town of Tengarong. But Colonel Kume was also hot on the heels of the Dutch defenders, capturing Luajinan and Samarinda by February 3rd and putting much pressure on Montero's forces. From Tengarong, the Dutch soldiers would continue to offer resistance until February 8th, when the Japanese forces managed to take the town. By February 15th, though, Montero had established new defensive positions at the towns of Benoa Baroe and Cotabangoan, from where he would continue to delay the advance of the Kume detachment until early March. Although the Samarinda II airfield was an important objective of the Japanese, who wanted to secure air superiority for when they launched their invasion of Java, time would eventually tell that it was not needed, as we'll see in the future. Back to Banjamasin, Yamamoto faced an important problem. There were no roads or bridges in the jungle-covered mountain ranges, making their advance towards Banjamasin very difficult. Furthermore, as they clambered up steep mountains, they also had to fend against swarms of mosquitoes, land leeches, and other insects. Yet by February 4th, the Japanese had reached the town of Moyara Oweja, successfully repulsing a small Dutch army, but failing to quickly pursue them towards Matapura. In response, the Dutch executed a scorched earth tactic, causing enormous distraction in the towns east of the Burrito River. By February 7th, reinforced by two brigades, the defenders also tried to make a stand at Kandangan, but they ended up retreating to some more solid defensive positions at Matapura. At this point, they had destroyed most of the airfields and oil fields in the area to prevent their employment by the enemy, with the evacuation of Benjamasin also well underway. The Okamoto unit had also captured the port of Kotabaroe on the northern end of Lawat Island on February 7th, then continuing southwards and landing on Banjamasin the next day, trying to cut off the defenders' escape. Yet by February 9th, some Dutch forces had already left East Borneo in boats, heading west towards Kotawaringen and leaving only a small number of men at the Oalin airfield. The following morning, an advance party of the Yamamoto unit finally came out of the jungles and defeated the small Dutch resistance capturing Matapura with the aid of the indigenous people. That same day, the Okamoto unit also arrived and captured the Oalin airfield, completing the conquest of Banjimasin. And then there's the GMC Sierra. Available with the connected driving experience. Meanwhile, in Amban, the Eastern Detachment continued their conquest of the island. General Ito had successfully captured the town of Amban by February 1st, forcing the main Dutch force under Commander Capitz to surrender and sent notes to the Australian commandos and Dutch soldiers under Lieutenant Colonel Scott to do the same. This message was lost, and the Australians fought on for two more days. We're now ready to project that lets you become a new reforester. You'll get at least one square foot of land in Scotland, with a certificate to not only show you exactly where it is, but to prove your new titles. This allows you to get Lord or Lady on your credit cards, plane tickets and more. It only takes five minutes to set up, so it's a great last minute gift for any loved one, and you can get a couple pack that lets you and your partner have adjoining plots of land. They also offer maps to show your new estate, including the immensely detailed, hand-drawn 1611 map by John Speed held by the National Library of Scotland. This is absolutely the best gift for Valentine's Day. It's fun and personalised. Make your loved ones a Lord or Lady of Scotland with established titles. They're even running a Valentine's Day sale with a special offer for our viewers. Use the code KNG to get an additional 10% off any purchase. 
Go to establishedtitles.com slash KNG to get your gifts now. Following the events of the last couple of weeks, General Sakaguchi and his detachment had achieved their second milestone in the Dutch East Indies operation, the conquest of Balik Papan. While the Kume detachment was mopping up the area, he was now preparing to launch the invasion of Banjamasin in conjunction with a naval strike force. But back on January 28th, it was finally decided that he would receive no support from the IJN and that his main forces would be appointed to support the invasion of Java. He then formed a strong unit under Colonel Yamamoto Kyohei, built around the main strength of the 146th Regiment. The plan for this unit was to rapidly advance towards the city of Banjimasin after going ashore at Tanagrogat, while a small element of the unit, under Captain Okamoto Yoshibumi, maneuvered along the coast in small boats to land in the southern area of the city and capture the Matapura airfield. On the night of January 30th, the Okamoto unit sailed from Balik Papan and started its advance. The following morning, the Yamamoto unit also departed Balik Papan and reached Adang Bay by the night of the same day. After landing, the Yamamoto unit quickly seized the town of Tanagrogot on February 1st. But the 60 Dutch soldiers of the local garrison had burnt the town before retreating. This began the widespread native support. Took the following morning, the Yamamoto unit also departed Balik Papan and reached Adang Bay by the night of the same day. After landing, the Yamamoto unit quickly seized the town of Tanagrogot on February 1st but the 60 Dutch soldiers of the local garrison had burnt the town before retreating. This began the widespread native support for the invaders and culminated with many desertions on the side of the Dutch. By February 3rd, all of the Japanese forces under Yamamoto had concentrated on Tanagrogot, finally starting their overland trek towards Banjimasin. At this point, Japanese forces were also very close to capturing the important town of Samarinda. From Lower Jinan, Captain Montero had been tasked with delaying as much as he could the Japanese advance towards the important Samarinda 2 airfield. But his mission was a very difficult one, especially since he wasn't allowed to launch any counterattack. Furthermore, the Kume detachment had already captured the oil fields at Sanga Sanga and the Japanese were now ready to continue their advance against the town of Samarinda. Only Montero's men stood in their way. On February 2nd, though, Dutch forces discovered that another Japanese column was advancing from Balik Papan towards Mentawir, forcing Montero to move again his headquarters, this time to the town of Tengarong. But Colonel Kume was also hot on the heels of the Dutch defenders, capturing Luojinan and Samarinda by February 3rd and putting much pressure on Montero's forces. From Tengarong, the Dutch soldiers would continue to offer resistance until February 8th, when the Japanese forces managed to take the town. By February 15th, though, Montero had established new defensive positions at the towns of Benoa Baroe and Cotabangoan, from where he would continue to delay the advance of the Kume detachment until early March. Although the Samarinda 2 airfield was an important objective of the Japanese, who wanted to secure air superiority for when they launched their invasion of Java, time would eventually tell that it was not needed, as we'll see in the future. Back to Banjimasin, Yamamoto faced an important problem. There were no roads or bridges in the jungle-covered mountain ranges, making their advance towards Banjimasin very difficult. Furthermore, as they clambered up steep mountains, they also had to fend against swarms of mosquitoes, land leeches and other insects. Yet by February 4th, the Japanese had reached the town of Moyara Oweja, successfully repulsing a small Dutch army, but failing to quickly pursue them towards Matapura. In response, the Dutch executed a scorched earth tactic, causing enormous distraction in the towns east of the Burrito River. By February 7th, reinforced by two brigades, the defenders also tried to make a stand at Kandanga, but they ended up retreating to some more solid defensive positions at Matapura. At this point, they had destroyed most of the airfields and oil fields in the area to prevent their employment by the enemy, 
with the evacuation of Banjimasin also well underway. The Okamoto unit had also captured the port of Kotobaroe on the northern end of Lawat Island on February 7th, then continuing southwards and landing on Banjimasin the next day, trying to cut off the defenders' escape. Yet by February 9th, some Dutch forces had already left East Borneo in boats, heading west towards Kotawaringen and leaving only a small number of men at the Oalin airfield. The following morning, an advance party of the Yamamoto unit finally came out of the jungles and defeated the small Dutch resistance, capturing Matapura with the aid of the indigenous people. That same day, the Okamoto unit also arrived and captured the Oalin airfield, completing the conquest of Banjimasin. Meanwhile, in Amban, the Eastern Detachment continued their conquest of the island. General Ito had successfully captured the town of Amban by February 1st, forcing the main Dutch force under Commander Capitz to surrender, and sent notes to the Australian commandos and Dutch soldiers under Lieutenant Colonel Scott to do the same. This message was lost, and the Australians fought on for two more days. With Ambon and the northern side of the peninsula secured, Ito then sent his main forces to defeat the stubborn Australian commandos to the south, but they could only establish a foothold on the Nona Plateau due to the strong Australian resistance. On February 2nd, SNLF Marines would launch a strong charge against the Laha airfield, but the attack made little progress and they suffered many casualties in return. In the meantime, however, a small Japanese force that had gone through the jungles into the highlands north of Laha defeated dozens of enemy troops and prepared to launch a surprise attack on the airfield. The following day, this attack was launched into the rear of the surprised Australians, quickly overwhelming their defences and forcing them to surrender. That same day, the main units of the Eastern Detachment captured an important highland in the centre of the Nona Plateau, getting very close to the southern tip of the peninsula and finally forcing the rest of the Australian commandos and Dutch defenders to surrender. With Ambon now firmly in Japanese hands, Ito would command mopping up operations for the next two days, then starting to prepare for the invasion of the island of Timor. We now take a quick detour towards the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, where two US carrier task forces, under the overall command of Vice Admiral William Halsey, launched aerial raids on February 1st, inflicting light to moderate damage on the island's garrisons and infrastructure destroying 18 aircraft and sinking or damaging several enemy warships. Concurrently in the Philippines, intense fighting continued across the Orion Bagak line, but especially at the Quinoran and Anyasan point, Japanese and Filipino forces were in a bloody struggle for control of the coastal points. Even despite their numerical superiority, the Philippine scouts and constabulary forces were simply not strong enough to push the invaders back and on February 1st, they would face a serious threat. Trying to secure control of the Quinoran Point, General Homa sent his last reinforcements during the night, but they would fail to land at their objective due to the strong aerial assault of the four remaining P-40s, an intense artillery barrage, and the deadly attack of American PT boats that sunk half the Japanese force and forced them to go ashore at Kanas Point. Now completely alone, the 600 Japanese soldiers at Quinoran began to slowly concede territory at high cost for the defenders. And back to the Orion Bagak line, the fierce American resistance had taken a heavy toll on the Japanese soldiers. After nearly a month of continuous fighting, the battered 16th Division and 65th Independent Mixed Brigade were discouraged and battle-weary. Despite this, General Nara persisted with great tenacity in his efforts to break through the eastern sector of the line. Alas, his efforts would be in vain, with each attack being repulsed by the Allied defenders. In the west, though, General Morioka fared much better, breaking through the 1st Division's jungle positions, but having his force split into two pockets behind enemy lines. In response, General Wainwright launched attack after attack against the Big Pocket, in which the Japanese north-south traffic and hinder the movement of troops westwards, but they were continually repulsed, with the invaders even expanding towards the west, 
Only by cutting their supply route behind them could the Americans really threaten the big pocket. Meanwhile, by February 5th, the Filipino forces at Quinoran had been reinforced with a tank platoon and 70 men from the 21st Pursuit Squadron under Captain William Ed Dias, successfully cornering the Japanese to a small area at the edge of the point. The airmen, led by Dias, would embark from Marivelis in two armoured whaleboats and gunboats on February 8th, then landing at Aglaloma Bay and decimating the remaining Japanese soldiers that had gone into hiding in some caves. With opposition at Quinoran Point terminated at last, the Allied defenders then concentrated on the remaining points that were still under the control of the invaders, finally overtaking these positions and bringing an end to two entire Japanese battalions by February 13th. On February 6th, Morioka prepared to launch a general offensive to re-establish a supply route with the Big Pocket, by employing a recently arrived battalion of the 33rd Regiment. Initially, the Japanese assault went really well, breaking the main line of the defenders and getting perilously close to the Big Pocket. Yet the efforts of Wainwright's men eventually paid off, and the invaders' advance was stopped. ...been transported to Isekai and turned into an adorable walking mushroom? see what happened next. There was a fat merchant coming to the village and bullying people. The adorable cat girl and dog girl were protecting me. I also wanted to stand up and protect them. Get rid of the bad guys. Let's build a village. Cultivate fields, open a tavern, a potion store, and a blacksmith shop. I have made a lot of money. Wow! I'm not just an ordinary mushroom anymore. All kinds of trades and businesses flourish in my village. Finally, waifu paradise awaits me. Enjoy the slow life in Isekai. Download now. We're not yet out of oil, but we're close to being out of time to develop cleaner, cheaper, and more stable alternatives. Different countries face a unique set of challenges that influence their journey towards net zero. Balancing today's economic priorities against tomorrow's necessities isn't easy. Realistically, it means some countries will transition now, others later. And all countries will need support with comprehensive solutions customized to their own circumstances and resources. This makes energy diversity essential. A sustainable energy system is, is one where you have a diverse set of supplies so that you are not dependent on a single country or a single type of energy. And secondly, it is a system in which you use that energy efficiently so that you're not wasting it. The benefits of a diverse energy supply are twofold. Firstly, you can guarantee supply because if a particular route or type of energy is unavailable, you can replace it with something. And second, you have a more stable price, which is absolutely essential for people to be able to afford the energy that is being produced. As a global energy solutions provider, Hanhua contributes to an optimal energy mix with its diverse energy portfolio. By consolidating its expertise across its entire business, production, storage, transportation, and power generation, it is also creating a comprehensive energy value chain that helps to stabilize the supply of diverse energy solutions. This allowed the Americans to concentrate on reducing these pockets, which came at a great cost for the defenders. Even despite the employment of tanks and the establishment of a cordon around the pockets, the ferocious Japanese could not be subdued. By January 9th, though, the little pocket had been abandoned, and the men fell into a trap to the west, where they were completely annihilated. With his offensive bogged down on both fronts, and the Battle of the Points lost, General Homer had no other choice but to order the withdrawal of all of his engaged forces all along the Orion Bagak line to some more secure positions. The soldiers under Nara then began to disengage and move north, while Morioka tried to support the evacuation of the men at the Big Pocket with another attack of the 33rd Regiment. By February 11th, 
the Japanese managed to successfully escape from the Big Pocket under heavy American pressure. The almost 400 soldiers would arrive back to friendly soil on the morning of February 15th, after a march of four days through enemy lines and thick jungle. By February 20th, the invaders had completed their withdrawal, and Homa was ashamed to request reinforcements from Tokyo. The transfer of the 4th Division was then approved, but it would take time to get it to the Philippines from Shanghai. In the meantime, the 16th Division and the 65th Independent Mixed Brigade would have time to reorganize, rest and refit, while a tight blockade would be enforced upon the Bataan Peninsula so the defenders could not escape, successfully capturing the island of Mindoro on February 26th. Nonetheless, this was a tremendous victory for the battling bastards of Bataan. Turning back to the Dutch East Indies, the staff of the Abdicom was very worried about the rapid progress of the Japanese advance through the Pacific. The main naval base of the Allied command, based at Surabaja, was within range of Japanese aircraft since the fall of Kendari, sustaining a heavy pummeling on a daily basis, and the battered naval forces of Admiral Hart were definitely outnumbered in the Pacific. Yet their bold raid on Balik Papan during the start of the battle had a very promising outcome, so Hart decided to form the Abda Striking Force, initially consisting of several American and Dutch warships, led by Dutch Rear Admiral Carol Dorman. By February 3rd, the Allied forces had gathered east of Surabaja, then preparing to sortie the following night to head through the Flores Sea towards the Makassar Strait, where they had learned that the IJN was going to carry out a landing operation. Hart's surprise attack was actually very risky, because the Allied fleet had to transit during daylight, where they could be easily discovered. Furthermore, Japanese bombers had already sighted them during one of their daily by January 9th, finally opened Dias, successfully cornering the Japanese to a small area at the edge of the point. The airmen, led by Dias, would embark from the nearly a month of of the Quinorin point. General Homa sent his last reinforcements during the night, but they would fail to land at their objective due to the strong aerial assault of the four remaining P-40s, an intense artillery barrage, and the deadly attack of American PT boats that sunk half the Japanese force and forced them to go ashore at Kanas Point. Now completely alone, the 600 Japanese soldiers at Quinorin began to slowly concede territory at high cost for the defenders. And back to the Orion Bagak line, the fierce American resistance had taken a heavy toll on the Japanese soldiers. After nearly a month of continuous fighting, the battered 16th Division and 65th Independent Mixed Brigade were discouraged and battle-weary. Despite this, General Nara persisted with great tenacity in his efforts to break through the eastern sector of the line. Alas, his efforts would be in vain, with each attack being repulsed by the Allied defenders. In the west, though, General Morioka fared much better, breaking through the 1st Division's jungle positions but having his force split into two pockets behind enemy lines. In response, General Wainwright launched attack after attack against the big pocket, in which the Japanese could block north-south traffic and hinder the movement of troops westwards, but they were continually repulsed, with the invaders even expanding towards the west. Only by cutting their supply route behind them could the Americans really threaten the big pocket. Meanwhile, by February 5th, the Filipino forces at Quinorin had been reinforced with a tank platoon and 70 men from the 21st Pursuit Squadron under Captain William Ed Dias, successfully cornering the Japanese to a small area at the edge of the point. The airmen, led by Dias, would embark from Marivelli's in two armoured whaleboats and gunboats on February 8th, then landing at Aglaloma Bay and decimating the remaining Japanese soldiers that had gone into hiding in some caves. With opposition at Quinoran Point terminated at last, the Allied defenders then concentrated on the remaining points that were still under the control of the invaders, finally overtaking these positions and bringing an end to two entire Japanese battalions by February 13th. 
On February 6, Morioka prepares to launch a general offensive to re-establish a supply route with the Big Pocket, by employing a recently arrived battalion of the 33rd Regiment. Initially, the Japanese assault went really well, breaking the main line of the defenders and getting perilously close to the Big Pocket. Yet the efforts of Wainwright's men eventually paid off, and the invaders' advance was stopped. This allowed the Americans to concentrate on reducing these pockets, which came at a great cost for the defenders. Even despite the employment of tanks and the establishment of a cordon around the pockets, the ferocious Japanese could not be subdued. By January 9th, though, the little pocket had been abandoned, and the men fell into a trap to the west, where they were completely annihilated. With his offensive bogged down on both fronts, and the Battle of the Points lost, General Homer had no other choice but to order the withdrawal of all of his engaged forces all along the Orion Bagak line to some more secure positions. The soldiers under Nara then began to disengage and move north, while Morioka tried to support the evacuation of the men at the Big Pocket with another attack of the 33rd Regiment. By February 11th, the Japanese managed to successfully escape from the Big Pocket under heavy American pressure. The almost 400 soldiers would arrive back to friendly soil on the morning of February 15th, after a march of four days through enemy lines and thick jungle. By February 20th, the invaders had completed their withdrawal, and Homa was ashamed to request reinforcements from Tokyo. The transfer of the 4th Division was then approved, but it would take time to get it to the Philippines from Shanghai. In the meantime, the 16th Division and the 65th Independent Mixed Brigade would have time to reorganize, rest and refit, while a tight blockade would be enforced upon the Bataan Peninsula so the defenders could not escape, successfully capturing the island of Mindoro on February 26th. Nonetheless, this was a tremendous victory for the battling bastards of Bataan. Turning back to the Dutch East Indies, the staff of the Abdicom was very worried about the rapid progress of the Japanese advance through the Pacific. The main naval base of the Allied command, based at Sorabaja, was within range of Japanese aircraft since the fall of Kendari, sustaining a heavy pummeling on a daily basis, and the battered naval forces of Admiral Hart were definitely outnumbered in the Pacific. Yet their bold raid on Balik Papan during the start of the battle had a very promising outcome. So Hart decided to form the Abda Striking Force, initially consisting of several American and Dutch warships, led by Dutch Rear Admiral Carol Dorman. By February 3rd, the Allied forces had gathered east of Sorabaja, then preparing to sortie the following night to head through the Flores Sea towards the Makassar Strait, where they had learned that the IJN was going to carry out a landing operation. Hart's surprise attack was actually very risky, because the Allied fleet had to transit during daylight, where they could be easily discovered. Furthermore, Japanese bombers had already sighted them during one of their daily raids, so the element of surprise was already lost. During the morning of February 4th, Japanese airmen from Kendari finally pinpointed the exact location of Dorman's forces near the Kangian Islands, so Rear Admiral Sukahara Nishizo of the 11th Air Fleet launched 36 G4M and 24 G3M bombers to get them. From the get-go, the Japanese aviators went for the Allied cruisers, dropping bombs over the Marblehead and the Houston. Although the Houston skillfully evaded all bombs, the Marblehead was hit hard on the quarterdeck, suffering heavy damage. The final attacks were then launched against the Houston and the De Reuter, with all of the bombs missing except for the last one, this scored a devastating hit over the Houston, causing severe damage on the American cruiser. By midday, Dorman realized that his forces were in great peril, so he started to retreat west back to Sorabaja. The first operation of the Abda striking force had ended in a fiasco, but at least they hadn't suffered any sunk ships. Meanwhile, with the mopping up of Ambon finally completed, the Japanese invasion fleet, commanded by Admiral Takagi, departed Kendari on February 6, escorting the Sasebo force of SNLF marines for the conquest of Makassar. Due to Dorman's failure at the Makassar Strait, this fleet was only hindered by a US submarine, which actually managed to sink the destroyer Natsushio. 
despite this, the landings proceeded according to plan on February 9th, and soon the 1,000 Dutch soldiers of Colonel Vorman were overwhelmed and forced to retreat into the jungles. The capture of Makassar marked the fall of the Celebes, where only some small guerrilla groups continued to operate. This also left the road to Java open at last, but still there was one major objective that the Japanese wanted to capture before launching their main offensive, the key airfield of Palembang in southern Sumatra. But you'll have to wait a little bit for that, as next week we'll cover the beginning of the critical battle of Singapore and the final conclusion of the Malaya campaign. Thanks to established titles for sponsoring this video. Buy a small plot of land in Scotland and become a lady or a lord, or give this title as an amazing and easy gift. In return, established titles plants a tree to protect the pristine forests of our planet. This is absolutely the best gift for Valentine's Day. It's fun and personalized. Make your loved ones a lord or lady of Scotland with established titles. They're even running a Valentine's Day sale with a special offer for our viewers. Use the code KNG to get an additional 10% off any purchase. Go to establishedtitles.com slash KNG to get your gifts now. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one. Candy Cup is officially here and there are a whole lot of rewards up for grabs. Could you be one of the 10,000 winners? Get swiping now. Since the start of the Pacific War, we've been following one of the major theatres of the Japanese offensive, the Malayan Campaign. Two weeks ago, the campaign came to its near end with the final retreat of the Allied soldiers towards the British fortress of Singapore. The Malayan Peninsula had been invaded back on December 8th, and the defence of the colony had shown a total lack of readiness on the side of the British government. Suffering defeat after defeat, and making a critical string of blunders, the Allied forces had rapidly been conceding territory, and only after two months since the invaders first landed at Kota Baru, they had been thrown back to the island settlement, which had been transformed into a fortress. But the British would see that their belief that Singapore was an impregnable fortress was as much a lie as their idea that they could intimidate the Japanese by employing a small naval force in the Pacific. Now the campaign is finally coming to its end, as the Japanese prepare to execute one of their most important operations of the war. For more on the pivotal battles of both world wars, our sponsor everything from the other documentary cost $4.99. Back on the morning of January 31st, the last of the Allied units, the 2nd Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, had crossed the Causeway Bridge into Singapore, with its two pipers playing a lament for an empire on which the sun was setting. From this moment onwards, the colony that had been at the great commercial crossroads of the British Empire had but a fortnight to live. General Percival faced two challenges to defend Singapore. First was to contest and defeat any Japanese invasion of the island's north coast, while the second was to protect the vital central portion of the island where most of the population and key infrastructure of Singapore was located. In an effort to strengthen the western and eastern ends of this vital ground, two defensive lines were envisaged to allow for a quick switch of forces between east and west and to make possible a rapid shortening of the front. These lines had been surveyed and drawn on a map, but were completely unprepared, and the northern shore of the island had a similar story. There were no plans for the defence of this critical front, so Percival quickly developed a plan to defend the coast with posts prepared for prolonged resistance. If the posts were surrounded, they were to hang on and wait for relief by a counter-attacking force, even though the defenders didn't have sufficient men or material to stage any counter-attacks. 
With this plan in mind, Percival ordered the defense of Singapore in four areas, with the southern area of Major General Keith Simmons, under the protection of the 1st and 2nd Malaya Brigades, the Straits Settlements Volunteer Force, and the Fortress Garrison Troops. The northern area, defended by the British 18th Division, under Major General Merton Beckwith Smith, which was at full strength, but lacked experience and appropriate training, and the 11th Indian Division, under the overall command of Lieutenant General Lewis Heath, who had previously overseen the two Indian divisions during the Malayan Campaign. The Western Area, manned by the 8th Australian Division of General Bennett, and the semi-trained 44th Indian Brigade, and a reserve area where Brigadier Paris had the undermanned 12th and 15th Indian Brigades. As we can see, Percival chose to appoint more forces to the northern area, believing that the main Japanese attack was going to come over here, although the invaders had other plans. Identifying a significant flaw in the Australian sector, where the depleted defenders were hopelessly dispersed, General Yamashita prepared the highly trained and well-led 5th and 18th Divisions to cross the Johor Strait on the western side, where it was at its narrowest, and therefore could diminish the chances of suffering heavy casualties. Meanwhile, he also deployed the Imperial Guards Division to the east of the causeway at the Tabrao River, where it was to stage a feint, followed by a secondary attack. This plan was very ingenious, because as the Imperial Guards occupied the island of Pulau Ubin and concentrated artillery fire over the east coast positions, Percival's conviction that the Japanese were going to invade the northern area would be fortified. I think I'm going to get fired. World War III going to happen. I think aliens might be real. Racing thoughts and annoying fight. The Japanese had other plans. Identifying a significant flaw in the Australian sector, where the depleted defenders were hopelessly dispersed, General Yamashita prepared the highly trained and well-led 5th and 18th Divisions to cross the Johor Strait on the western side, where it was at its narrowest, and therefore could diminish the chances of suffering heavy casualties. Meanwhile, he also deployed the Imperial Guards Division to the east of the causeway at the Tabrao River, where it was to stage a feint, followed by a secondary attack. This plan was very ingenious, because as the Imperial Guards occupied the island of Pulau Ubin and concentrated artillery fire over the east coast positions, Percival's conviction that the Japanese were going to invade the northern area would be fortified. On February 4th, the Japanese began artillery barrages upon Singapore Island, with their aerial superiority allowing them to have excellent knowledge of the Allies' positions. On the other side, the British had to send small reconnaissance patrols on February 6th to cross the Johor Straits and gather intelligence on the Japanese positions. The patrols successfully reported large concentrations of enemy troops facing the western area, but only saw a few landing craft on the Malayu River. This caused Percival to discard the gathered intelligence as insignificant, with the Malaya command still believing that the main attack of the invaders was coming towards the northern area. Finally, on February 8th, the Japanese launched a heavy barrage of the Australian positions. The invasion of Singapore was just mere hours away. Shortly before night, the Japanese forces started the crossing of the Strait of Johor in 300 vessels, aiming to land between Cape Bulo and Cape Murai and capture the Tengar airfield with haste. On the northwest coast, Brigadier Harold Taylor of the Australian 22nd Brigade had deployed his three battalions across a front approximately 14.6 kilometers wide. He didn't have sufficient men to cover every piece of ground. He had recurring communication problems, and his water obstacles were almost non-existent. As a result, his position was very vulnerable. On the right, the 2nd 20th Battalion was about to face the full strength of the Japanese 5th Division, while to the left, the 18th Division would split to assault the two remaining Australian battalions, three Japanese battalions against the 2nd 18th Battalion, and four Japanese battalions against the 2nd 19th Battalion. During the night, the Japanese soldiers continued their crossing of the Straits. Upon detecting their approach, the defenders waited until they were within 40 metres to rain upon them a withering hail of machine gun and artillery fire. 
the vanguard of the invaders suffered enormous casualties as a result. But the Japanese barges kept coming, and they started to pinpoint gaps in the coastline where they could land virtually unopposed. Soon great concentrations of enemy soldiers began to outflank the scattered Australian machine gunners, forcing them to destroy their guns and retreat during the early hours of February 9th. Although some units managed to withdraw in order, most did so in disarray, with many getting completely cut off or fighting a series of hand-to-hand -hand struggles to escape. At the Murai River in particular, the Japanese moved down the river in strength and surrounded the retreating defenders of the 2nd 19th with a series of roadblocks at their rear, while on the northwest coast, the 2nd 20th's men were overwhelmed by the 9 battalions of the 5th Division, losing their commanding officer and suffering several ambushes that inflicted heavy casualties upon the defenders. From both of these battalions, only about a company each would manage to escape towards the Tenga airfield. Meanwhile, the 2nd 18th would successfully reach Amakeng with half of its forces intact. Yet despite this, the 22nd Brigade had been effectively rendered combat ineffective. With the invaders securing their position on the northwest coast of Singapore, Bennett sent the reserve 2nd 29th Battalion to Tenga to support the defenders, while Percival also prepared the 12th Indian Brigade to move to Kiat Hong and occupy the Jurong Line for the incoming Japanese attack. In the meantime, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade sought to defend a line running east of Tenga through the village of Bulim, trying to give time for their compatriots to get to Jurong. By nightfall, the Allied forces had completed their assembly at the Jurong Line, being further reinforced by the 15th and 44th Indian Brigades. But at the same time, after an increase of Japanese artillery fire, the Imperial Guards Division started to cross the 1.1 km wide Krenji River at the Causeway Sector. This time, the Australian machine gunners not only caused enormous losses on the invaders, but they also managed to hold their ground. Yet despite this, Brigadier Duncan Maxwell of the 27th Brigade decided to withdraw from the critical Causeway Sector by midnight. It appears that he wanted the Malaya Command to surrender to avoid a senseless slaughter. Thus, after destroying their oil tanks, the defenders began to retreat to a perimeter behind the Mandai Road and the Woodlands Road, allowing the Imperial Guards Division to safely land without further interference. At this point, it would seem clear that the Japanese had completely concentrated at the west of the island, but Percival would fail yet again to denude his other areas to adequately reinforce the Jurong Line. As Ben was saying, we're releasing a card called Legion. Legion says, on reveal, replace By the early morning of February 10th, the Imperial Guards Division was still consolidating their position at Krenji, and they were threatening the 11th Division of General Key. Immediately, Key sent the Reserve 8th Indian Brigade to counterattack and recapture a position just south of the former perimeter of the Australians. This attack would fail, causing the death of many Indian defenders. And so Percival assigned the 27th Brigade under Key's command so he could use it to contain the Japanese invaders. Further south, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade finally abandoned Bulim to occupy the central position of the Jurong Line between the 12th and 44th Brigades. In case this line fell to the enemy, Percival had also issued orders to take new positions at an inner point. Brigadier Taylor completely misread these orders upon receiving them, retreating towards Reformatory Road while the Japanese started their attack on the 12th Brigade of Paris. With the threat of getting outflanked by the Japanese to the north and west, Paris then had no choice but to withdraw towards Bukit Pajang. This left a considerable hole in the Jurong Line, and by midday, the invaders began to move down the road to attack the southern end of the line. In response, some Allied units undertook a limited withdrawal, causing a domino effect that ended with both the 15th and 44th Brigades retreating eastwards. By afternoon, the Jurong Line had been between the 12th and 44th Brigade to Immediately, Key sent the Reserve 8th Indian Brigade to counterattack and recapture a position just south of the former perimeter of the Australians. This attack would fail, causing the death of many Indian defenders. 
and so Percival assigned the 27th Brigade under Key's command, so he could use it to contain the Japanese invaders. Further south, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade finally abandoned Bulim to occupy the central position of the Jurong Line, between the 12th and 44th Brigades. In case this line fell to the enemy, Percival had also issued orders to take new positions at an inner point. Brigadier Taylor completely misread these orders upon receiving them, retreating towards Reformatory Road, while the Japanese started their attack on the 12th Brigade of Paris. With the threat of getting outflanked by the Japanese to the north and west, Paris then had no choice but to withdraw towards Bukit Pajang. This left a considerable hole in the Jurong Line, and by midday, the invaders began to move down the road to attack the southern end of the line. In response, some Allied units undertook a limited withdrawal to contain the Japanese invaders. Further south, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade finally abandoned Bulim to occupy the central position of the Jurong Line between the 12th and 44th Brigades. In case this line fell to the enemy, Percival had also issued orders to take new positions at an inner point. Brigadier Taylor completely misread these orders upon receiving them, retreating towards Reformatory Road, while the Japanese started their attack on the 12th Brigade of Paris. With the threat of getting outflanked by the Japanese to the north and west, Paris then had no choice but to withdraw towards Bukit Pajang. This left a considerable hole in the Jurong Line, and by midday, the invaders began to move down the road to attack the southern end of the line. In response, some Allied units undertook a limited withdrawal, causing it to contain the Japanese invaders. Further south, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade finally abandoned Bulim to occupy the central position of the Jurong Line between the 12th and 44th Brigades. In case this line fell to the enemy, Percival had also issued orders to take new positions at an inner point. Brigadier Taylor completely misread these orders upon receiving them. retreating towards Reformatory Road, while the Japanese started their attack on the 12th Brigade of Paris. With the threat of getting outflanked by the Japanese to the north and west, Paris then had no choice but to withdraw towards Bukit Pajang. This left a considerable hole in the Jurong Line, and by midday, the invaders began to move down the road to attack the southern and withdraw towards Bukit Pajang. This left a considerable hole in the Jurong Line, and by midday, the invaders began to move down the road to attack the southern end of the line. In response, some Allied units undertook a limited withdrawal, causing a domino effect that ended with both the 15th and 44th Brigades retreating eastwards. By afternoon, the Jurong Line had been completely abandoned to the surprise of the Japanese, who hadn't even engaged the defenders there. At the same time, General Wavell arrived at Singapore and after being informed of the British blunders, ordered the creation of a fresh reserve, composed of three battalions of the yet unused 18th Division to help the Allied units in their defence of the key Bukit Timar area. He also ordered Bennett to launch a counter-attack to regain the Jurong Line, using the 12th Brigade to the right, the 15th Brigade in the centre, and the 22nd Brigade on the left flank. By midnight, this operation would prove a disaster. On the right, Paris lost half his forces due to desertions and the efficacy of tenacious Japanese soldiers, while the 2nd 29th Battalion was pummeled by a strong tank attack that forced them to retreat to Tenga. Hot on their heels, the Japanese tanks would follow on and capture the road junction at Timur, severing the 12th from the rest of the Allied forces and forcing Paris to retreat towards Tanglin. Meanwhile, the 15th and 22nd Brigade had made some progress, but they were to be cut off by the 5th Division, which was very close to taking Tenga. The defenders would then be subsequently decimated by the 18th Division in the early hours of February 11th, 
with few survivors escaping towards Pasir Panjang and Reformatory Road. With his battlefront completely lost, Bennett desperately ordered the reserve Tom Force to recapture Bukit Timah and then Bukit Panjang against the full might of the 5th and 18th Divisions, who had now consolidated their positions. Under black clouds of burning oil, the British soldiers were, as expected, rapidly repelled by the elite Japanese divisions, suffering heavy casualties and being forced to retreat. Bennett now only counted with the Tom Force at the race course, and with the 44th Brigade around Pasir Panjang, joined by the 1st Malaya Brigade, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade, and the 2nd Battalion of the Gordon Highlanders. While east of the racecourse, Percival ordered General Heath to organize the defense of Singapore town, who then established the Massey force in a line that extended to Thompson Village. But to the north, Brigadier Maxwell yet again committed a terrible decision when he ordered his 27th Brigade to launch a counterattack towards Bukit Panjang. By the morning of February 12th, the brigade had been surrounded and had to retreat, yet again leaving Heath's left flank in great peril. Gordon Highlanders. While east of the racecourse, Percival ordered General Heath to organize the defense of Singapore town, who then established the Massey force in a line that extended to Thompson Village. But to the north, Brigadier Maxwell yet again committed a terrible decision when he ordered his 27th Brigade to launch a counterattack towards Bukit Panjang. By the morning of February 12th, the brigade under black clouds of burning oil. The British soldiers were, as expected, rapidly repelled by the elite Japanese divisions, suffering heavy casualties and being forced to retreat. Bennett now only counted with the Tom Force at the race course, and with the 44th Brigade around Pasir Panjang, joined by the 1st Malaya Brigade, the remnants of the 22nd Brigade, and the 2nd Battalion of the Gordon Highlanders. While east of the race course, Percival ordered General Heath to organize the defense of Singapore town, who then established the Massey force in a line that extended to Thompson Village. But to the north, Brigadier Maxwell yet again committed a terrible decision when he ordered his 27th Brigade to launch a counterattack towards Bukit Panjang. By the morning of February 12th, the brigade had been surrounded and had to retreat, yet again leaving Heath's left flank in great peril. The general then acted accordingly and evacuated the northern area to better positions further south. Yet the Imperial Guards Division rapidly attacked the 8th Brigade near Nesum and achieved a devastating victory. At the same time, the 5th Division started its assault over the racecourse, overcoming the defences of both the Tom Force and Massey Force and forcing them to retreat. With the threat of a Japanese breakthrough towards Singapore town, Percival finally ordered Bennett to establish new defensive positions at a line that stretched from Buena Vista to Tanglin Holt and from there to the Bucket to Marfara Road Junction, while Heath established his 18th Division on a line that went from this junction through Thompson Village towards the Woodley Crossroads, and his 11th Division from Woodley to the Payalabar Airstrip. Lastly, the 2nd Malaya Brigade took positions between this airstrip and the Kalang Airfield. This was to be the final defense of Singapore. A UK man is arrested for posting his thoughts to Facebook. An aid package for Israel gets pushback. It turns out... As dawn broke on the morning of February 13th, the Allied soldiers' morale was unraveling, with no hope of avoiding Singapore's final demise. The new defensive perimeter lacked depth, both in numbers and equipment. The Allied units had suffered many desertions. Many soldiers had given up the fight. Supplies were very low, and the city of Singapore had been constantly and mercilessly bombed from the air and shelled from the ground. In response, Percival called a general meeting with his commanders at Fort Canning, where both Heath and Bennett strongly advocated for an immediate capitulation, something that Percival himself vehemently opposed. An evacuation using all of the remaining ships at Singapore Harbour was nonetheless ordered resulting in the final evacuation of 1,800 military personnel and 1,200 civilians for Java and Sumatra. The rest would have to stay and face death or imprisonment. 
The day also saw Bennett concentrating most of his remaining formations in an 11km concentric perimeter around Holland Road and the Tanglin Barracks. There they would continue to resist the Japanese incursions, although the invaders would largely leave them alone, and to the north, the British defenders would be repulsed from Thompson Village, having to establish new defensive positions to the north of Bradell Road. Meanwhile, the Japanese, ever closer to their final objective, concentrated their attack on the front held by the 1st Malaya Brigade around Pasir Panjang, penetrating their defensive line and forcing them to retreat to Buena Vista. The following day, Yamashita finally managed to concentrate his entire army on Singapore Island, applying pressure all along the battlefront, but deciding to concentrate his assault along the southwest coast. Around Raja Road, the 1st Malaya Battalion was attacked yet again, suffering heavy casualties as the invaders broke through towards Bukit Chermin and captured the water supplies of Singapore. During this attack, elements of the 18th Division got to the Alexandra Hospital, where the Japanese committed another act of indiscriminate slaughter against defenseless non-combatants. In the north, Japanese tanks also broke through and reached the outer limits of Mount Pleasant, leaving the British defenders in a U-shaped loop, while to the east, the Indian defenders successfully managed to resist the assaults of the Imperial Guards Division. In the end, though, Percival realized that the water supply of Singapore town was imminently going to collapse, so he knew that the only options were to counterattack to restore the town's water supply and food dumps, or to capitulate and avoid a senseless slaughter of his civilian population. On February 15th, he finally bowed to the inevitable and decided on the latter. Yamashita later wrote, My attack on Singapore was a bluff, a bluff that worked. I had 30,000 men and was outnumbered more than 3 to 1. I knew that if I had to fight for long for Singapore, I would be beaten. That is why the surrender had to be at once. I was very frightened all the time that the British would discover our numerical weakness and lack of supplies and force me into disastrous street fighting. In total, the British had suffered 138,708 casualties in the Malayan campaign, with more than 130,000 becoming prisoners of war in the Pudu and Changi prisons, as well as the other prison camps across the Thai Burma Railway. In comparison, Japanese casualties totaled only 9,824 for the entire campaign. With the fall of Singapore, the Malay barrier had been breached, and Burma and the Dutch East Indies now laid ripe for the taking. The Japanese would now launch their invasions of Sumatra and Lower Burma. So don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of the Pacific War. You should subscribe and press the bell button if you want to be notified about our videos. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one. I'm Carter Scherer and the Candy Cup is officially here and there's a whole lot of prizes up for grabs. Will you be one of the 10,000 winners? Two weeks ago, we covered the fall of the last key cities and airfields in Borneo, the Celebes and the Moluccas. From the airfield of Kandari II alone, the Japanese had already achieved their goal of having the necessary range to successfully conduct air operations over Java. Yet to be completely certain that their most important offensive was going to come to fruition, the Japanese commanders had decided that they first wanted to take southern Sumatra and the important airfield of Palembang. Last week, we also saw the Japanese pierce the melee barrier for the first time, with the capture of Singapore, and today they turn to Burma, to start their advance on one of the most important British ports in Southeast Asia, Rangoon. Join us as the Empire of the Rising Sun commences the invasions of Burma and Sumatra. Clearly, conquest is a pretty uncertain way to grow a state's wealth, but for you, there's a much safer option, thanks to the sponsor of this video, Masterworks.io.
at an estimated value of $1.7 trillion, projected to increase by another $900 billion over the next four years, art can make for a lucrative investment, usually reserved for those with the immense wealth needed to enter the market in the first place. Instead, Masterworks, an art investment platform, allows you to buy shares in art pieces, ultimately allowing you to receive a return when they're sold. Art prices are up 164% from 1995 to 2021, while key market analysts such as Morningstar expect returns of 5% or less in the stock market, making art a great place to diversify your portfolio. In 2020, they sold a Banksy, returning 32% to their investors. You can get started by just making an account on their site to choose your investments, and once registered you can use their secondary internal market, where you can buy and sell art shares among other Masterworks investors, similar to stock trading on Robinhood. There's a waitlist for making these fine art investments, but use our link in the description to skip it and start immediately, plus it supports our channel, so check it out. As we've covered previously, General Imamura had appointed the 38th Division of Lieutenant General Sano Tadayoshi to conduct the invasion of Sumatra. After their successful capture of Hong Kong, the division had advanced into Kamran Bay by January 24th, while the 3rd Air Force had been executing air raids over Sumatra's main airfields since late December. Furthermore, Japanese forces had also occupied the Anambas Islands on January 26th to set up air bases for conducting the Sumatra and Java operations. This was because the invaders were planning to parachute a regiment of paratroopers over the key Palembang airfield, while the bulk of the 38th Division landed at Banka Island and navigated up the Muzi, Saleh and Talang rivers to support the attack on Palembang. Once Palembang was finally in Japanese hands, the invaders then planned to swiftly seize the Matapura and Tanjung Karang airfields as well as the oil installations around Talangabab and Limau. The first landings would be carried out by a two-battalion strong advance party that departed Kamran Bay on February 9th, with the rest of the division following them two days later to ascend the Musi River and join the battlefield. The 38th's landings were to be supported by a strong fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral Ozawa Jizaburo, mainly consisting of six cruisers and 11 destroyers from the 2nd Fleet and the Southern Expeditionary Fleet. On the other side, the Dutch counted with four territorial commands on the island of Sumatra, under the overall control of Major General Roloff Overacke. In South Sumatra in particular, Lieutenant Colonel Vokosang had at his disposal about 2,000 men at Palembang, with a further two companies at Jambi, some 2,000 British reinforcements, and the support of 15 Hurricanes, 35 Hudsons, and 40 Blenheims from the RAF. Although a parachuting operation was not expected, the Dutch, led by Admiral Helfrich, were expecting a naval invasion so Admiral Dorman's ABDA striking force was ordered to Orsthaver with the objective of intercepting the invasion fleet. On February 14th, with reports of Azawa's convoy approaching southern Sumatra, Helfrich ordered Dorman to depart Orsthaver and carry out a decisive attack on the invaders. But at the same time, the Japanese paratroopers, led by Colonel Kume Seichi, finally started dropping over the Palambang airfield, covered by elements of the 3rd Air Division. Despite the slow speed of the Japanese Ki-56 transports and the vigilant patrols of the RAF, the invaders achieved complete surprise in their paratrooper operation, aided by the dense smoke of the burned oil fields of Borneo and the Celebes. By midday, 180 men had been dropped into the airfield, with a further 90 men coming down on the oil refineries of Pajoa. While strafing the Dutch anti-aircraft defences, Japanese planes also dropped weapons, ammunition and other equipment for the paratroopers to employ. Benefiting from the close air support, Kume's men quickly engaged and defeated waves of Dutch soldiers, inflicting heavy casualties on them and successfully capturing the Joe's oil refineries. Yet the fighting was bitter nonetheless, with staunch resistance from the defenders that tenaciously held on to the airfield. By midnight, however, the airfield would also fall into the hands of the invaders, causing General Overacker to order a general retreat towards Osthaver, from where they would be evacuated. 
At this point, the advance party of the 38th Division had also entered the Mentok Anchorage, with one battalion heading towards Banka Island and the rest of the party approaching the coast of Sumatra. Meanwhile, in the early hours of February 15th, Baz Luck struck Dorman's striking force as the Dutch destroyer Van Ghent ran aground in the Stolza Strait and was lost due to the damage suffered. A couple of hours later, Dorman also lost the element of surprise when they were sighted by a Japanese float plane from the carrier Chokai. Air attacks soon followed, with Dorman recalling the outcome of the Battle of Makassar Strait and ordering his forces to pull back. While they retreated, Japanese bombers continued to drop bombs over the Allied fleet, but at the end of the day, only minor damage would be inflicted on the Allied vessels. This was, however, Dorman's second defeat at the hands of Japanese air power, leaving the Japanese invasion fleet unimpeded to proceed with its plans. I've been traveling the In the meantime, 60 more paratroopers were dropped over Palembang to reinforce the Japanese forces, which were conducting mopping up operations and were consolidating their gains. While the advance party successfully seized Mentok and its airfield, and under a rain of fire and bombs dropped upon them by the RAF aircraft, then started to ascend the Musi, Teleng and Sala rivers en route to its objectives. Thus the invaders rapidly got to Palembang and successfully made contact with the paratrooper force. At this point, Kume and his men had advanced into the city of Palembang, and by nightfall, the 38th soldiers would help him secure the city. On the next day, contact would also be made with Pladjoa's oil refineries, and the main strength of the 38th Division would finally arrive at the mouth of the Musi River. But meanwhile, General Sano ordered the Tanaka detachment of the advance party to advance south towards Tanjung Karang. Departing on February 17th, the Japanese quickly seized the Talangjima oil field, but their advance was bogged down by the swamp forests of the region. By February 19th, units of the Tanaka detachment managed to capture the Matapura airfield after a minor engagement, then continued their advance with haste. That same day, the Japanese had also completed their conquest of Banka Island, while Sano sent the Kanki detachment to capture Lahat and Benkulu, and one infantry company to advance against Jambi. By dawn on February 20th, the Japanese had crossed the Manda River and had gotten to Tanjung Garang. But despite their efforts, most of the Dutch defenders had been evacuated from Oosthafa on February 17th. The invaders could only catch a glimpse of the rearguard of the defenders as they sailed away on two gunboats. The Tanjung Karang airfield would be captured on February 21st at long last, then being quickly put to work for air operations against Java. On this day, the Kanki detachment also departed Palembang and captured Lahat on the 22nd, Lubuk Lingao on the 23rd, and after crossing a mountain range, Benkulu on the west coast on the 24th. Jambi would finally fall into Japanese hands on March 4th, concluding the invasion of southern Sumatra. The operation had been a huge success for the Japanese Empire, capturing several airfields and oil refineries that could further aid the war machine of the rising sun. Although most of these were in a pretty bad state, the invaders would quickly set out to repair them so that they could put them to use for the empire. The Japanese were also planning the invasions of Bali and Timor, the last of Java's Dahor before the main operation of the Dutch East Indies campaign. Although we'll cover Timor in more detail next week, the capture of Bali was assigned to the Kanemura detachment, consisting of a battalion of the 48th Division under Commander Kanemura Matabe. They had travelled to Makassar by February 15th, from where they would finally depart three days later, escorted by a support fleet consisting of the cruiser Nagara and some seven destroyers. Concurrently, when Admiral Helfrich discovered that the objective of the invaders was Bali, he quickly met with Dorman on February 18th and devised a very flawed plan for a counterattack. Since the vessels at the disposition of the Dutch admirals were scattered and coming from different bases, the plan was for the attack to develop in three stages, with each group attacking separately against what they believed was a large Japanese force. In all fairness, instead of a counterattack, this plan looked more like a raid. 
but despite their hastiness to stop the invasion, the Japanese had already entered the Sano anchorage by midnight, successfully landing on Bali in the early hours of February 19th and jeopardizing the entire point of the Allied attack. Upon landing, the Kanemura was escorted by a support fleet at Tebe. More in more detail next week, the capture of Bali was assigned to the Kanemura detachment, consisting of a battalion of the 48th Division under Commander Kanemura Matebe. They had traveled to Makassar by February 15th, from where they would finally depart three days later, escorted by a support fleet consisting of the cruiser Nagara and some seven destroyers. Concurrently, when Admiral Helfrick discovered that the objective of the invaders was Bali, he quickly met with Doorman on February 18th and devised a very flawed plan for a counterattack. Since the vessels at the disposition of the Dutch admirals were scattered and coming from different bases, the plan was for the attack to develop in three stages, with each group attacking separately against what they believed was a large Japanese force. In all fairness, instead